from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for day three of coverage of Big Data Week which comprises of our event, Big Data SV and Strata Hadoop right across the street. This is theCUBE Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host George Gilbert, analyst at wikibon.org. Our next guest is Holden Corral. She's the principal software engineer, Big Data at IBM. Welcome to co-author of Learning Spark. Yeah. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me. So, Spark is hot. It cut the head off the Hadoop beast, as we heard earlier on, on theCUBE. Cloud's taking the legs out, but you got Hadoop is still rocking and rolling. A lot of innovation going on, Spark's one of them. So give us the update, Learning Spark, the book's out, you co-authored that. You got office hours coming up here this afternoon for folks who are watching who might be around, you got office hours. What's what's going on? I mean, how advanced is Spark? Where's the progress bar? I mean, certainly big, the big day uh, Spark Summit was interesting, East, and now got the West one coming right. up. What's the update? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening in Spark, and, and the big thing is Spark 2.0 is, is coming this year, right? And that's, that's really exciting because it's an opportunity to sort of like get rid of some of the dead weight, um, the like things that have built up and some of the cruft and, and also a lot of really new exciting things, right? Like um, sort of going from the RDD model to, to the data set model and, and allowing people to mix uh, functional and relational queries together really, really easily and sort of bring, bring their expertise together so that like maybe a more traditional business analyst can more easily work with Spark and, and have that work productionized by, by traditional data Is that engineers. a polite way of saying the hardcore Spark Developers have to kind of mainstream it because, I mean, Spark has been an example of what I, you know, what I call the, you know, the developers that, you know, eat glass and spit nails, the DevOps guys that, that pioneered a lot of the stuff we saw with the early cloud days. Right. So you kind of got to socialize it into the mainstream enterprise. A lot of heavy lifting's got to get done, fill the gaps in, right? Yeah, I, I think there's. So w with any technology, right, like your, your first version is great and it's, it's wonderful, it's very lean and it doesn't have a lot of like security or, or other things like that. And as time goes on, you, you have to add all of these things to make it a really good enterprise product. And I mean, that's part of where companies like IBM come in, sort of adding the things that the enterprise needs so that they can adopt this. Um, and, and Spark SQL is, is also very much like opening up the kinds of people that can make Spark programs, right? Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's tons of business analysts who, if I asked them to write Scala code, would be like, oh no, that's, that's, that's quite all right, you, you, you can handle that. that, you can take yeah. that one. Um, but I mean, I don't have the time to, to help all those business analysts, right? And so it's, it's really powerful to, to be able to give them the tools that they're used to working with and being able to work with actually really, really large scale data at sort of the speeds that Spark is. So Spark SQL uh, is really great there. And, and the data set thing especially makes it a lot easier for us to sort of mix the, the more traditional like relational queries that, that the business analyst might come up with. And then in the few cases where it's like, oh, this part's really slow, I need to redo it for performance. It's really easy to, to sort of like do the, the nitty gritty engineering parts without having to sort of shift between systems and then different paradigms. So you let the other tools kind of integrate in. It's a lot of integration. Obviously IBM has the big Spark investment yeah. uh, and you're involved in that. What's your take on that? Where is that investment? Because a lot of folks see IBM as validation as right. a big player, but they're donating a lot to the community. They are, um, and so I work uh, at the Spark Technology Center in San Francisco, where we're focused on, on just open source Spark. Um, and it's, it's a really great thing. Um, there's people also working on libraries on top of Spark, right, like System ML, uh, brings a lot more machine learning capabilities on top of Spark as well. I don't work on it personally, but they're in the same office with me, so they're, they're clearly cool people. They're in the elevators. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. Um, and and we, we plan to steal some of their code and, and bring it into Spark when they're not looking. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of, of really smart people doing doing a lot of productionizing of, of Spark. And if you look at sort of where the contributions are coming, uh, you can see that a lot of them uh, from IBM have especially been focused on Spark SQL. Um, and sort of after that, like the machine learning libraries are, are the next sort of area of focus in terms of the number of contributions that we've been getting in to, to Spark. Um, and so that's, those are the two sort of like really key things that we've been working on. Let me pop up a level on that, on the contributions about SQL and, and machine learning. That it, we were talking earlier about um, the huge sort of investment um, IBM made 16 years ago, no, maybe 17 years ago in Linux, and all the software they ported to it, and, and how it legitimized Linux, because there was the proprietary flavors of Unix at the time, and then there was Windows, which was still teething. Right. Is this a, um, a comparable investment 
I think in, in a lot of ways, there's, there's many parallels, right? Like IBM started the, the Linux Technology Center inside of IBM to focus on just open source uh, Linux, and then they've, they've done the same thing with the Spark Technology Center. Um, but beyond the, the parts that are just focused on the open source, right, there's, there's this massive shift internally to bring a lot of things to run on top of Spark. And, and so um, I field slash ignore a fair amount of questions from product teams about how to get their things better working on Spark. Um, but so there's, there's a lot of IBM products which you know, are, are starting to come towards using Spark as their execution engine. In, in the same way that we were seeing a lot of the open source Hadoop products are also switching from traditional MapReduce as their execution engine to using Spark, right? Like, you know, you can't make new machine learning algorithms inside of Mahout anymore if it's not in Spark. And there's, there's Hive on Spark is coming, right? These, all these things that have used... It's a bandwagon kind of thing going on with Spark big time right now. Yeah, everyone's essentially gone, well, my old execution engine, that was nice, but this new thing is so much better. It's worth it. And, like, it's a huge investment to port all of this code, but it, the returns are just... It, it's so amazing in terms of, like, you're able to handle problems of just a completely different scale. And, and so Give me an you, example you of, kind of that, that, those yeah. scale points, because that's, that's what everyone's kind of betting on, that, that order of magnitude. What are some examples of, right. of order of magnitude you've seen? So, I mean, most of... So I, I work in, in kind of a weird spot, right, which is I, I mostly work on this machine learning and core stuff uh, with a bit of Python thrown in. Um, and, and actually, I, I think the Python's on really cool. Um, but a lot of things that you're seeing are people that have traditionally been stuck with doing sort of like single machine processing, and they just, you know, you have to downsample your data. Or if you're doing MapReduce, right, you can do like large scale compute, but it's no longer interactive, right? And, and as a data scientist, your workflow is so different when you have to like come up with a problem and you know think is this maybe a solution and then like sleep on it and come back and find the answer versus like oh I, I this this probably doesn't work but I'll just give it a quick shot right and you find so many more things when when you're able to do your large scale stuff interactively so basically the cadence of how someone actually thinks yeah. matches, <laughs> matches the environment maybe versus maybe not quite right like you still might have to go get a cup of coffee for a really complex yeah. thing but it's, it's you don't lose not, a day, though. You don't yeah. lose your, your step, basically. You kind of get a little bit of a pause. Can, can you give us some, some more uh, concrete, concrete examples of, of products that are now moving their execution engines over to Spark and then the, the change in that, um, in sort of the cycle time? Sort for of the responsiveness, them? yeah. yeah. Um, so I, since I, I just work on the engine itself, I actually don't work on the products that much, so I, I don't have too much experience with, with what the products themselves are in terms of, of their changes. But, um, I mean, there's, there's the Pandas stuff where the, essentially, like, people have been having to do, like, hour-long MapReduce jobs to, to, like, manually sort of try and get back some of the functionality that they, they want to, to do some complex analysis. And, and essentially, they're, they're going from hour-long or, or day-long jobs to, to, like, you know, 30 minutes. Um, or 10 minutes if, if their data is, is nice. And, and it's, really, it's really awesome because they're, they're just able to, to actually view the whole data and, and not have to sample. Although I want to ask you about machine learning. It's a fascinating area for us. We've been playing a lot with our data science platform that we have at Silicon Angle. And, and, and a lot of people get confused between you know, um, supervised versus unsupervised, which is a concept I would like to explore with you. And then also we heard last night from on our analyst panel this notion of algorithms, policing algorithms, because the quality of the algorithms is becoming an issue. Yeah. The data is just an part of the data, the envelope around it is the algorithm, which is data as well. Yeah. So who's it, policing the algorithms, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, I'm actually, yeah. So there's, there's, there's a bunch of things policing the algorithms. Um, and there, there's actually like Spark's pipeline model makes it really, a lot easier to do things like hyperparameter tuning, uh, so where you're going to do things like, I, I made my model, um, oh wait, no, no, I'm actually going to have my algorithm try and figure out what the best parameters are to make my model for me, because I don't have the time to do that. Um, but for, for in terms of like producing the, policing the quality of like the, the actual algorithms between uh, releases of Spark, I mean, it's just traditional you know, yeah. unit testing and, and all of those good practices. Um, that, that you really need in, in any project. Um, but for like actually like validating that your stuff is working really well, there's not a lot of great tooling there. Um, one of the projects that I work on is Spark Validator. It's, it's a very small project, um, but it's sort of focused around you know, doing things like, and, and it's not something that people should use today. Um, like don't, so don't it's early. And install it. it yes, yeah, very early stage. 
Um, but it's like the kind of thing where you you hook it into your Spark job, and like maybe uh, it, it's going to build up sort of a historical understanding of what your Spark job looks like, and then. If the number of records you read today went down from the number of records you read yesterday, it's going to be like, hey, maybe don't publish this model. The results are probably junk. Um, and, and I mean, of course, if you're an engineer, you can come in and be like, no, no, it's cool. Like, we actually lost 10% of our user base. I'm really sad, but, yeah. but go ahead and publish the model. <laughs> um, or you come in and you're like, oh, dear God, like, yeah. someone dropped the table last night. We're screwed. We should go and fix that yeah, yeah. And, and avoid It's a notification. It's really things. a ping, if you will. It's like, yeah. gives you a heads up. It's a ping, but it's also a ping which halts doing an automated deploy, right? Because yeah. a lot of people, um, I, I did a survey for sort of like how people were using Spark, and about a quarter of people were automatically deploying the results of their Spark jobs into production, um, which is great, right? Like, I mean, that means Love automation. it's really well tooled. If it's good. <laughs> yeah, if it's good, it's great. But when it explodes, it's pretty terrible, right? Because you, you, you know, it explodes at 2 o'clock in the morning, and no one likes getting yeah. getting well someone's, done. Yeah, someone's, someone's going to hit the fan. So in some of the research we've been doing, we, we talk about this progression of, of applications from, well, data lakes where it's people just getting their sort of feet wet yeah. often with uh, machine learning um, and to intelligent systems, of, uh, intelligent systems of engagement where there's machine learning behind the um, interactions to help anticipate and influence um, yeah. the user. But then there's a third phase where we talk about, which is where machine learning is put on the process of uh, sort of the design time and the runtime chain of improving and benchmarking, coming up with better m machine learning algorithms. Yeah. Um, where are we on that spectrum? Like, how far out of is that in terms of rocket science? So I think different organizations are in very different places, right? Like, as you've mentioned, a lot of people are just still getting their feet wet with the data lake. Um, but I think a lot of people are sort of at the data science on data science um, stage, right, where they're, you know, they're, they're collecting all of these metrics and they have all of these analysts and then they realize, you know, maybe some of the stuff that they're doing could be useful for each other. And so they start to like do meta-analysis to figure out what sort of, you know, where their data is coming from, which pieces can be shared between the organization and sort of how to, how to be good in this, this art department. And for like sort of automating the models, we're there-ish, I guess would be the expression. Um, I mean, you can you can tune on hyperparameter tuning, and you can be like, "Good luck, have fun," um, but it's it's not like a thing which a lot of people are doing yet, right? And and a lot of the pipeline stuff where you so like the feature selection, you know, you 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 can just like make a giant set of features, right? Like one of the bug reports I had was someone who who had a million features and was running into some problems with that um, because they were using it in Python, and, <laughs> and Python has some some corner cases, um, but essentially like. We're at the point where, where some people are sort of in that phase, but I would say most people aren't really doing machine learning on their machine learning models so themselves. It, in, in, to put that in perspective, it sounds like IBM is experimenting with it, which means it might be mainstream five years from now. or, or I, might... I think sooner than five years. Okay. I, I, think, I think we'll see a lot more people using machine learning to, to do a lot of their tuning um, for their machine learning models much sooner than five years. Um, maybe two, but I'm I'm also an optimist, so you know and who knows. That pipeline that you're talking about is multiple machine oh, yeah. learning um, machine learning um, uh, algorithms. In other words, when you talk about just to sort of right. level set for us, may, uh, uh, those of us who are um, what's the word um, where we're uh, having one of those. Uh, um, brain cramps that's early onset uh, Alzheimer's. We'll, we'll get um, more coffee after this. Uh, yeah, I do need that. Energy um, drink. George does the five-hour yeah, energy drinks. I, I, I found them. Um, where we're, uh, where we're take, if, if you're using a million parameters, you've got a whole bunch of models in, in an ensemble, and yeah. it's hard for one person to have in their head how to tune that. And that's that's very true for for ensemble training, um, right? It's it's not something where you can you can really sit down and think about it. Or if you have a million features, right? It's it's really difficult to sort of manually do feature selection. You're not you're not going to want to do that. That's just not feasible, right? You're you're going to use you know some regularization techniques to to sort of narrow that down. Um, and and these pipelines are are actually frequently um, so there's this sort of a, like artificial. Uh, sort of separation, um, which is going away in Spark between sort of what's called, you know, estimators and models. Um, 
but like uh, there, there's all of these different machine learning components that are sort of fed together. Um, and it's not always like a straight line, right? Like sometimes there's branches and, and they come back, right? It, it doesn't have to be like, this is the text processing that I do and then I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do this, right? It, it can be very, very complex and that entire thing um, builds our model, which is which is really cool, but but also uh, runs into the problem of how the hell do I save this damn thing? Um, because the the whole pipeline itself, it's, it's now right. You don't just have a linear model; you have like six different models together that generate the inputs that you're using for your linear model. And your well, take that one step further, which is we wonder. In addition to those classes of apps, before I had that brain cramp, there's the um, how repeatable can we make that? In other words, mm. you know, in the past, for decades, we've had packaged applications, but we don't see big packaged applications emerging anytime soon for this class of apps. Can you help shed some light on either why that is or, or why that might be wrong in a few years' time? I, I think we'll, we'll see more sort of packaged applications to make this kind of thing easy, right? Um, not everyone wants to write Python or Scala code to, to generate their machine learning model, right? Like, R is, is becoming increasingly popular. And, and there are actual, like, sort of more BI-type tools that, that people can use to generate models. Um, and, and, and those will probably become increasingly popular with time. But, but the repeatability is, is actually a really hard problem. Um, and this, this can be especially frustrating uh, when, when you're trying to improve the code that you're using to, to generate your models, because you know, the, the new version of Spark maybe has you know, a better optimizer, but I still want to be able to reproduce my results from last year in case like, the auditors show up. It'd be really nice if I wasn't just like, oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it worked last year. Don't, don't worry. You know, I, I want to I be able to show them what I did. Um, and, and I think that, that, that goes back somewhat to export support, right? Um, and, and with having good export support, I think we'll also get a better idea of like, being able to store this, this additional state information so that we can actually reproducingly train our models. And we can, we can actually be like, OK, so if I just changed the data, but I kept everything else the same, like how would things be? Or you know, if I keep all my data the same and I just changed my model, like how are things? And that's not maybe something which works super well today, but I think we're getting there really quickly. Um, and there's been a lot of a lot of improvements in sort of this exporting and and keeping all this information that we need. Hold, I want to get your take on the marketplace right now. Obviously, you're in the trenches. It's great to see the experience getting down and dirty there with the with the tech, which is great. But you know, a lot of people have been complaining that not enough machine learning going on at the event. That we need more um, more tech faster, especially around machine learning. Do you agree with that? You think we're okay? Where are the areas that need to be improved? What's going? What's working? What's pe what are people doubling down on? What are your thoughts on kind of the status of where we're at with ML and? So, so I think there's there's a lot of room for improvement in machine learning, right? Um, it's it's just huge, right? There's there's so many possible models, um, and we could just spend our time trying to implement all of these models in a distributed fashion, but I don't think that would be a really good use of our time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I think really what would be what would be really great is if sort of the pipeline APIs and these things got to the point where making these things pluggable for, for other people was really easy for them to do. Um, and, and to some extent, I mean, that's part of what System ML aims to accomplish. Um, even though I don't work on it, I'll That was a big donation, awesome. by the way, too. That was fantastic. Oh, yeah, no, wonderful. And, and a lot of really smart people came over with that, so I'm very, very happy that I get to pick their brains. Um, but it makes it a lot easier to, like, for, for the people who are just true machine learning experts, right? Like, they don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about distributed systems. And, and system ML tries to sort of hide some of the distributed systems part from, from the machine learning implementers themselves. So they can implement things in, in more of like an So you're seeing a impact. wave of this open source now with ML out there, with system ML, a lot more action going on. You're seeing a lot more coming. Yeah, I, I think. I think there's a lot more things in the pipeline, uh, and I think it's a really exciting time to, to be in this space. Okay, two, two personal questions. Show the shirt there. It says, I will cut you as a unicorn. Yeah. Certainly, the unicorns are being cut themselves. Valuations are being slashed. <laughs> uh, and, so, and second question is, is there another book on the horizon? There is. Um, I'm working on High Performance Spark with uh, my co-author, Rachel, who's, who's wonderful. Uh, and we just got an early release, the first four chapters. 
uh, are out as of as of this week. So if anyone feels like giving me money, that's pretty cool, um, <laughs> especially if you have a corporate expense account, buy one for home and one for the office. Um, if you're searching for it, though, you're going to have to add O'Reilly to the end of it because there's apparently high performance spark club plugs. And I didn't think very well when we were coming up with the title. Uh. And those are for some reason more popular than my book. It's well, very sad. Well, good luck with that. Thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing the insight. It's been fantastic. So, thank you so much for having me. Okay, great. This is theCUBE. We're live in Silicon Valley. Day three, wall to wall coverage. This is theCUBE. We go out to the events to extract the signal from noise. And we will be machine learning our butts off in Ireland as we go to Hadoop Summit next week. And uh, we'll be right back with more after this short break. <laughs>